right. Osio Ganali, a Jujalagihi, a Jujalagihi, a El Eoni, Daniel Justice, Don Guadon. Uh, it's a real delight to be here um, on this panel in particular, but with all of these uh, wonderful thinkers. I want to thank the organizers, especially Lionel and uh, uh, Christina, uh, and so many others who've done so much amazing labor to bring this uh, incredible gathering together. Uh, it's been a very generous and generative uh, space for thinking together, and I'm really, uh, really, as I say, chuffed to be part of this, all of this. Um, and I did want to flag that I will be talking, uh, especially to five tribes and Oklahoma folks, I will be gesturing to um, issues of violence, especially violence against women and children. I'm not going into specific details, but I did want to at least flag that um, just uh, because it's more, it has a particular um, significance to, to us. So um, just to let you know that that's coming. When the Indian Citizenship Act passed in 1924, Native people in the Indian Territory had been U.S. citizens for nearly a quarter century. On March 3rd, 1901, in an obscure six-word amendment to Section 6 of the General Allotment, or Dawes Act, the 56th U.S. Congress declared that every Indian in Indian Territory was now a U.S. citizen. And this just gives you a sense of what the area I'm talking about is on the right in the teal. Um, mostly I'm talking about the five tribes, uh, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole, and Muscogee, but it also includes a number of other smaller nations in the um, upper corner. So just to give you a little bit of a sense, this is the far, the, the eastern side of what would become Oklahoma. And this is the uh, amendment. So every Indian in Indian territory was now a U.S. citizen thus unilaterally redefining the citizen status of the five tribes, who had mostly resisted allotment and U.S. citizenship in spite of the Curtis Act's extension of Dawes allotment provisions. And you can see it here. Originally, it said that U.S. citizenship would be bestowed provided they had adopted the habits of civilized life. With this amendment, those habits didn't matter. All Indians in Indian Territory were U.S. citizens. While the Dawes Act had initially posited consent as a precondition for U.S. citizenship, and here I note uh, David Wilkins' uh, helpful analysis of this component of citizenship in his remarks yesterday, consent is immaterial to the 1901 Amendment, which ties U.S. citizenship for five tribes members solely to geographic location rather than political status or kinship or social context, thus entirely erasing indigenous legal orders, and I think of Mishwana's uh, presentation from yesterday. It bears noting that although referred to as a five tribe citizenship act, Indian territory included more than just our nations. Past when allotment is still very much in the early stages of land distribution and the slow dissolution of tribal institutions and resources is underway, this act presupposes the absolute completion of that process through the imposition of settler citizenship, thereby collapsing temporal realities and imposing them over native space and sovereignty. There was no particular fanfare to the passage of this still somewhat obscure act, no great public acknowledgement. Like so many of the policies that dramatically impacted five tribes life in Indian territory, the summary imposition of U.S. citizenship was largely a procedural mechanism, but one that aimed to erase any doubt which legal order Native people would be subject to in the Indian Territory, that of the colonizers, not their own nations. And what were the benefits of U.S. citizenship for the five tribes? As we've heard extensively yesterday and today, U.S. citizenship has always been a vexed status for Native Americans. In spite of the Dawes Act's assertion that citizen Indians were, quote, entitled to all the rights, privileges, and immunities of such citizens, end quote, U.S. citizenship was indeed, to quote Professor Simpson, a colonial conceit that fundamentally imposed obligations to the state while neutralizing five tribes, courts, and governments, thereby severing access to alternative legal or political remedy to, state, to harms of the state and its white citizenry. 
By the time of the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924, five tribes communities had nearly 25 years familiarity with the so-called rights, privileges, and immunities of being a native person with U.S. citizenship. Nations that had once been tightly linked through bonds of kinship and community across collect collectively held land bases were largely economically self-sufficient and had robust social and political lives had been profoundly traumatized by the dispossessive policies of allotment and its myriad extractions. The impacts are still felt to this day, as much for individual families as for our national governments, and as can be seen in the continued assaults by the state of Oklahoma on Native sovereignty. It's not only the 1924 passage of the ICA that is worthy of attention. That year also saw the release of a report by the Indian Rights Association titled Oklahoma's Poor Rich Indians, an orgy of graft and exploitation of the five civilized tribes, legalized robbery. A long title. Co-authored by famed Yankton Dakota writer, activist, and artist Gertrude Bonin, pen named Jit Kala Shah, who we saw um, earlier, who was one of the three field investigators who traveled to Oklahoma to study conditions of five tribe citizens. The report offers a scathing counterpoint to the rhetoric of civilized beneficence and justice that underpinned the ICA. And here's Gertrude Bonin um, roughly from that era. The context of the report is the release of sales restrictions on the land allotments of five tribe citizens. Initially for those designated as having less than 50% blood quantum, along with those of freedmen, and later those of higher blood quantum, and especially the result of the ending of restrictions on allotments following an allotment holder's death. So this is the, the cover of the, of the report. Oklahoma's Poor Rich Indians is therefore an investigative report on the impacts of the 1908 transfer of five tribes probate matters from the Department of the Interior to Oklahoma County Courts. Ned, probate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's like, it's like like you put it in there for me. With tribal courts extinguished by U.S. fiat and the federal government's disengagement from protecting Native interests, local and state courts were ostensibly the only avenue for justice for the now U.S. citizens. But the federal government firmly set the fox in the hen house by transferring probate to local control, local white control. And white Oklahoma authorities swiftly and mercilessly colluded in myriad ways to dispossess five tribe citizens of their lands and funds, their inheritances and resources. U.S. citizenship be damned. In his opening remarks to the report, Herbert Welsh, president of the Indian Rights Association, baldly states, quote, their report discloses a situation that is almost unbelievable in a civilized country and makes it clear that a radical and immediate change of the system in vogue is necessary if the members of the five civilized tribes are to be saved from pauperization and virtual extermination." End quote. That such an assessment came from Welsh, who had been full th a full-throated advocate for Native assimilation since co-founding the IRA in 1882, gives some indication of how dire the situation had become. Indeed, in the report summary itself, the authors start with the following assertion, quote, the estates of the members of the five civilized tribes are being and have been shamelessly and openly robbed in a scientific and ruthless manner. In many of the counties, the Indians are virtually at the mercy of groups that include the county judges, guardians, attorneys, bankers, merchants, not even overlooking the undertaker all regarding the Indian estates as legitimate game." End quote. The report chronicles the legal systematic collusion of white authorities to strip five tribe citizens of their lands and resources. It will make for familiar, if no less appalling, reading for those who read or watched the Osage experience of Killers of the Flower Moon. Sixteen years before white Oklahoma historian Angie DeBow brought national attention to the same situation, more thoroughly supported with archival documentary evidence, but without the same immediacy of direct interviews and personal observation, Bonin, in her role as research agent for the Indian Welfare Committee of the General Federation of Women's Clubs, 
along with her white co-investigators Charles H. Fabens of the American Indian Defense Association and Matthew K. Sniffen, Secretary of the Indian Rights Association, offered harrowing accounts of wide-scale theft, forgery, and fraud, but also outright robbery, malnourishment of children, kidnapping, human trafficking, rape, drugging, and even manslaughter and indications of murder. With rampant conspiracy and collusion between judges, lawyers, police, politicians, and the euphemistic category of thief known as a, quote, professional guardian, which the authors define as a class that seems to be indigenous to the soil of but one state, Oklahoma. And here I think it's a quite chilling connection to both uh, Celine and Ned's uh, presentations. They further note the deep involvement of the Oklahoma congressional delegation in pushing for laws that extended the state's control and authority over native estates, offering this bleak assessment in response to a proposal to further reduce restrictions on higher blood quantum landholders. Quote, that may be taken to indicate that the grafters whose appetites have been whetted by plundering the thousands of mixed bloods from the, whose land restrictions were removed are tired of waiting for the full bloods to die and are looking for more easy picking, end quote. The list of outrages is long and depressing, and the mundane and quixotic nature of the exploitation is shocking in its casual consistency. But even among these, the following observations indicate something of the problem especially regarding native children. And these are both quotations. And I'm, I'm redacting the last name of, of the one person who's named in the second example. These grafters often keep a birthday book, so they will know when the miners with estates come of age, which means the restrictions on the lands of the mixed bloods are automatically removed. They have been known to go to the government Indian schools to call on these miners, and promise them presents of gold watches, or invite them to share their homes after they leave school, or become of age. So that's the first. Aki, Full Blood Creek, had land adjoining Bartlesville. When she was four years old, she was taken by a man named Lanham and raised as his own child. Her land had oil on it. When she became of age, her guardian owed her $22,000. The guardian was also the father of Aki's illegitimate child. He robbed her of her money and her virtue. The child was given away. In their analysis, the authors note that, quote, it is impossible to state the total number of Indians who have been plundered or the value of their property, but of the 64,339 whose restrictions were removed in 1908, probably not more than 5 or 10% have anything left, end quote. Their fear was that the 18,000 remaining restricted Indians and their full-blood heirs would be immediately subjected to abuse and impoverishment, and worse, by the increasingly flagrant means by which white settlers were laying claim to their property. Their fears would be justified as further releasing of restrictions continued the catastrophic hemorrhaging of land and resources from the tribes and their citizenry that continue even now. And this just gives a little bit of a sense of, of some degree of the land loss. The report is 39 pages long and makes for very grim reading, and the particulars, while important, are beyond the scope of time we have today. Instead, I want to wrap up with a few thoughts on why Oklahoma's poor, rich Indians is significant to our discussion here. First, the report puts the lie to the claims about citizenship that rationalized white authority over the Indian territory, and by extension, all Native people. By 1924, it was more than clear that U.S. citizenship offered few protections to the rights of indigenous peoples and instead left indigenous peoples entirely at the mercy of a ravenous settler citizenry and its legalized theft and abuse. Considered in the long and violent history of five tribes' dispossession, the imposition of U.S. citizenship through the Dawes Act Amendment, as well as the ICA, might best be seen as an integral rationalizing feature of colonial domination and land dispossession, 
one that fully enmeshed five tribe citizens within state authority and control alongside the overthrow of our protective indigenous legal orders and kinship relations. Very much the weapon of destructive destruction and misery that Audra quoted. Secondly, the report was written by native and white ref reformers who had seen firsthand the catastrophic unfolding from progressivist policies. Bonin's distinctive voice and growing radicalism is readily identified throughout the report, and I, I feel pretty confident that she's the primary writer. And considering this text alongside her other literary contributions extends our understandings of her work in particular and its political evolution. Indeed, the powerful language of the report communicates a growing realization that the assimilationist policies that had grounded allotment and civilization initiatives had created extraordinary harm. They didn't become U.S. citizenship skeptics, but they came close to the edge. By implication, the report demonstrates that those in greatest need of the virtues of civilization were in fact the educated lawyers, judges, businessmen, and other white men who so viciously preyed on Native people. I think it's also worth noting the particular dangers for Bonin in the field investigations, um, given that she was a phenotypically Native woman asking very probing questions about Indian finances and the well-being of Indian people in eastern Oklahoma during their field investigations in the fall of 1923. And also thinking about the emotional toll for her in particular, uh, given how so many of the um, the reports that they have um, from Indian people are about the experiences of women and girls. Um, and it's very likely a lot of this information would not have been trusted to them without Bonin's presence. Just. There's, there's a story here that I have not gotten into, but I, I think there's something really important about her role in this work and the field investigations themselves. The damage enacted by these policies is beyond com categorizing in some ways. But just to give you one example, in 1898, just prior to allotment, Cherokee land holdings were about 7 million acres. In less than a decade, that number was reduced to about 4.4 million divided among 40,193 Cherokee Nation citizens. By 1934, a decade after the Indian Rights Act, or Indian Citizenship Act, it was less than 1.5 million acres. In 2009, the, earliest, the latest figures I've been able to get, we had just over 100,000, a 98.44% loss in just over 100 years. So these numbers, as stunning as they are, don't include the associated harms to individual Cherokees and to Cherokee families. The disruption of language and cultural transmission, the familial rifts and dispersals, or the myriad other ways in which disconnection from land and community have imperiled tribal belonging. Nor the ways our nations and generations of tribal citizens have worked to reverse those harms. Third, as has been noted by others here, for all its problems, U.S. citizenship has had mixed effects, some better than others. Although, as noted yesterday, U.S. citizenship was no guarantee of due process or equal protection under the 14th Amendment, those protections have been repeatedly cited by five tribes' freedmen descendants in their righteous struggles to be recognized as tribal citizens. The U.S. citizenship that accompanied allotment in the 1901 Act, among other legislation, has been vital to that ongoing labor, and in the case of Cherokee Nation at least, to freedmen's successful reenfranchisement and restoration of their status as tribal citizens. While the larger arc of U.S. citizenship has been a deeply damaging one for our nations, Native people have never been passive in experience or in response. Our peoples have constantly navigated the ever-shifting terrain of rights and belonging in both productive and hurtful ways. And U.S. citizenship is among the many colonial structures with which we've had to grapple. Honestly facing these realities is vital, as is doing so with a nuanced and culturally informed understanding of five tribes' cultural adaptation that eschews simplistic narratives about cultural assimilation or mercenary service to American imperialism so often in vogue among historians. The authors of Oklahoma's Poor Rich Indians offer an almost desperate conclusion 
in the remedy, which is the last section. Quote, there is no hope of any reformation of the present system. And if action is delayed for a few years, there will be no Indians with property to be protected. End quote. They argued for legislation to be enacted to return all Indian property back to federal authority, to care for the most vulnerable native people from exploitation, and to extend those protections over all Indians in Oklahoma. That protection wouldn't come in any recognizable form for another generation. Instead, just a few months after the report was released, Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act. Wado.